And this conflict between feelings and effectiveness is such a critical aspect of learning and really succeeding in general. It's like if you let your feelings get in the way of success, like you'll, you'll always, you'll, you'll always lose because ultimately like you have to challenge your feelings in order to succeed because you have to, you have to do what's the right thing to do rather than what feels good in the moment. Thank you for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. And when I was studying your story to prepare for this, I was thinking about where a good place to start might be. And I figured that writing for TechCrunch would be the place that that really makes sense. Why did you start writing for TechCrunch and what did you learn from that experience? That's such a funny start. Very few people talk about this or ask me about it. So I was in a job I wasn't happy with and a friend of mine at a basketball game in Washington, D.C. said, hey, I know that you're interested in tech. Have you heard, ever heard of TechCrunch? And this was in February. And uh, I had so much free time at work that for the next couple of months, all I did was read TechCrunch. And I read TechCrunch. I read Crunch Gear at the time. They had multiple brands. I read Mobile Crunch. And I slowly got to know the writers, their story, how they write, what they write about. And over the next couple of months, it just became completely obsessed. I read every single article, I think, during a four-month period, which is really hard. I mean, blogs put out a lot of content. <laughs> um and then at some point, uh, Greg Comparic, uh, who was the editor of the Mobile Crunch uh, section of the website, he put out a post saying, we're looking for interns. And it was truly opportunistic from my end. You know, I had done some journalism in high school, but never thought of myself as a writer. And I saw that opportunity and said, well, this could be fun. And it'll be a way to get my foot in the door and gain some credibility. And so I applied. I spent the whole weekend on my on my application. And so I put some, some effort in. But I honestly had no idea that I would get the job. I totally was just on a whim sending this in. And within 15 minutes, I got a message back saying, you're in. You start tomorrow. <sighs> and then they added me to the campfire which was the product that they used kind of like a slack alternative and i joined campfire the next morning and started writing stories and then what did you learn from that experience i learned so many things it's hard to start you know first i learned that i think the imposter syndrome faded pretty quickly so one of the experiences that I've had just throughout my life is just when you finally get in the room that you feel you're an outsider on and you realize that everyone in that room is totally fallible and human, and yet they still produce amazing work. You know, I was very impressed with who I was working with. But when the, when I was able to humanize them, it created an approachability to their work that made me feel like maybe I could contribute to this organization. And that was probably the biggest lesson. The second biggest lesson was definitely just like learning what makes, you know, a, a news article. Why would someone post one thing over another? And then third is how to write. You know, n news is such an interesting sort of medium for writing that most writers never deal with because you're on an extremely fast deadline. You get Ex extremely quick feedback loops, especially on the internet. And uh, so you learn how to write quickly, clearly, and uh, productively. Like you learn how to make sure your words count in a way that I think very few other writing media do until Twitter, which I would say does that even more. What was the publishing cadence around that time? Well, I was an intern, so I could choose what my publishing cadence was, but I was publishing about three times a week. Yeah. The reason why I ask is because it seems like 
from looking at so many people that I respect and admire, they started out writing on this weekly cadence, if not daily cadence, of just putting their thoughts out there, looking at the news, and being able to dissect it. Um, the other example I'm thinking of is Morgan Housel, who started writing at Motley Fool, and now The Psychology of Money is a bestseller. And it's like James Clear, similar thing, where he was writing on his blog, and that led to Atomic Habit success. And I'm, I'm curious how, how much that translates to running companies as well. How much does being a great writer translate to helping a company grow? I think it's not a necessary skill to be successful, uh, but it's really helpful. So I write regularly as a way to persuade others and persuasion is a critical skill. There's just many ways to do it and writing is one of them. Uh, so writing everything from cold emails to memos to raise money to memos about the company's trajectory and where it's headed to gain alignment within the organization, uh, writing as a form of feedback via Slack. These are all ways in which you utilize writing in a super highly leveraged way in a company. But I would also say that you don't need to be an expert. It's just a really helpful skill. That makes sense. And so when you're looking at and working at TechCrunch, are you, you're forced to look at the technology issues of the day, the news of the day, where we're going. Was it around this time where you started looking at it and be like, oh, there, there's a space here for online education? It happened at the same time, but I don't think they were directly related. Mm. I think I was just throwing everything at the wall and seeing what sticks. And I was simultaneously, you know, in TechCrunch writing, again, as an intern. So I had a full-time job throughout this time. And I was also uh, in the Founder Institute, which is a startup incubator that I joined. And we were basically building, uh, trying to build a company. So the company idea, I think, came more from my personal experience. Uh, in high school, I started an, uh, an in-person learning company, like wow. a summer camp. And I have always had a really significant feeling about school and like a huge fan of certain things about school and a huge detractor about other things about school. And so I think my interest in online learning has a lot more to do with just my personal journey than it does with writing for TechCrunch or MobileCrunch. Mm. But I'm sure that the fact that I was writing there gave me a lot of credibility as a potential founder, credibility I did not have before that. And it gave me an insight into what clicks for VCs and for reporters. So you were able to get a sense for speaking their language. That, Correct. that makes sense. That's actually the number one thing. I, I should have said that to begin with, but I came in not knowing anything about what the language of startups and tech was. And reading TechCrunch gave me a significant understanding of the language of startups, which is so important to entering an industry. And it's one of the things that so many people skip over. They like never spend the time to learn what a given industry is like and how it operates. They just want to start their company. They're so me focused. And I think one of the things I did really well, completely by accident, is I spent like, you know, almost six months obsessed with the industry as an outsider before I became an insider. And so by the time I was attempting to be an insider, I had all this institutional knowledge that I just gained from free content on the internet. And then I spent another you know, year attempting to use that knowledge in various ways, failing constantly, and then finally got to the point where I could articulate my own thoughts and my views on what, you know, Udemy was going to be or what, what its potential was to the point where people actually took it seriously. Why were you so obsessed? Just personal interest. There's no other. I did not have visions of grandeur when I was starting this out. I was, I did not know that I could 
start a company. I had no idea that that was even an option, which is crazy, right, Danny? Because I literally grew up in Silicon Valley. Like I grew up in Fremont, California, okay? My dad worked at startups. Everyone's, every uncle that I had growing up and a lot of the aunties too, all in my like Indian family friend circle worked at startups, started companies, were in VC, et cetera. But as a kid, particularly in an Indian environment where they don't really talk about their work very much, like the parents don't, we just had no idea that that was a career trajectory. That's so fascinating. Do you feel now some level of responsibility to help others in that way where you didn't know that that was a possibility? So you want to show people like, look, you can, you can be from my background and also have this outcome. Certainly I feel a responsibility to spread the gospel of what's possible I'd also say that I feel like over the last 15 years, this gospel was spread by, you know, thousands of people in my industry. I, I was certainly a part of that, but I was a small, small part of it. And so now it's kind of the opposite where I'm like, I wish that less people were going into startups because I think there's a lot more people who shouldn't be doing it than there are people who are doing it because for good reasons. Whereas when we started or when I started, and when I say we, I mean our, my cohort of fellow entrepreneurs, I don't think there was anyone I met or very few people I met were in it for the wrong reasons. People were in it because they, th they thought that they could make a difference and because they were ambitious and they weren't trying to be someone they weren't. And so when you look at the landscape today, do you feel like people are doing it for the wrong reasons? I think there are a lot of people who are doing it for status and ego and not doing it because it's truly like a, a personal calling or because it's a good fit for their skill sets. And, and when how, I say skill sets, I mostly mean their constitution. And how would somebody go about figuring out or looking at their own behavior right now to realize if they're doing it for the right or wrong reasons? Self-awareness is a tricky thing. I don't know how to teach someone how to be more self-aware. I can just tell you what the conditions are for what I've seen in successful founders. And then each individual person has to assess for themselves whether or not they're really in it for the right reasons. But me even pointing out that there are people in it for the wrong reasons is a message that someone out there might hear and think, oh, yeah, that's me. Or that's not me, and it might give them more confidence to move forward, which is equally powerful. What were the reasons that you started Udemy, and what were the underlying reasons that you weren't conscious of in that moment? Yeah, the stated reason was to disrupt education. I mean, I, I didn't like school, right? I loved school until I was uh, in ninth grade. As soon as I entered high school, I started to really dislike school. I felt betrayed because I was such a school fan. And then I sort of, in my rebellious teenage years, started to see, it, start, it started to all be exposed to me, like the, 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 the sort of myth uh, unraveled before my eyes. And as it did, I became deeply passionate about trying to improve the system. So that's why I started Udemy. That's the ostensible reason. But the reason underlying it was, you know, I think a deep feeling of not being good enough in the sense that I always thought I was better than what other people would assess me at. Mm. I think that's still true today for what it's worth. I still feel that way. When I was a kid, I always felt like I was smarter than I was getting credit for. I was better than I was getting credit for. And probably sometimes I was right and sometimes I was totally wrong. And I just had an inflated sense of ego and self. I totally get that. But, you know, Berkeley, which is where I went to college, was my last choice. It was my backup choice for going to school. I get that that's a very privileged position to be in from an academic perspective. But look, I thought I should get into Harvard or Stanford. I was like, fuck this Berkeley bullshit. Like, and then I went to Berkeley and, you know, as a freshman, I had decided I was going to graduate in three years. So I applied to their business school program, which you have to apply as an internal student to get in. It's a 50% acceptance rate. And then I 
was rejected from it because I was a first year student. You're supposed to apply in your second year. And I had two C pluses as well. So that didn't help. Um, but I was pissed because then I went to the business school and showed up to a bunch of classes and I was like, I deserve to be in here more than a lot of the other people who are here. And look, I'll be honest, I'm a little bit, you know, self-confident. So I'm willing to say that, but like, I genuinely believed that I was, you know, I, I sailed through my business school classes. I never attended class, got straight A's. Like it was, it was so easy. I was like, I cannot believe that the system told me I wasn't good enough for this. And then I went to apply for, for jobs and the same thing happened again. I applied for McKinsey and Bain and I totally thought that I was qualified for those positions, but I ended up at Accenture, which was a second or third tier, you know, consulting firm. And I think slowly over time, all this sort of rejection, and of course it wasn't rejection, you know, the flip side of all of this is I got into Berkeley. I graduated in three years in, in with an economics degree, which was awesome. I also like ended up at Accenture and got a full-time job when a lot of people don't, you know, so, so there's plenty of wins here, but I felt like I was being shortchanged by the system and by others. And so I think I just really wanted to take matters into my own hands and see what happens. In one sense, I can't help but notice that all the greats find up ways to make themselves better by creating scenarios that are not accurate to put a chip on their shoulder. Like you see that with Michael Jordan. I'm following Colorado football. I'm seeing that with Deion Sanders and what he's doing. And I'm just like, wow, this is a common theme. And entrepreneurs do this all the time as well. The other part of me is like, you're just living in a false reality. And what are you giving up to achieve greatness, quote unquote, in that sense? And so I, I understand both perspectives. I guess, how did you come to see both perspectives yourself? It's been 15 years since I started Udemy. Okay. That's a long time. <laughs> Done a lot of executive coaching, therapy, self-reflection. I took a three-year sabbatical. Like I've just done a lot of different things that have added perspective. I've slowed down at various times. I think slowing down allows you to have perspective. I've seen others succeed and fail around me. You know, I'd put myself at the like top 25th percentile of the people who I started companies with in the 2008 era. So I can at least look at that and say, there's a lot of positives in there. And then I can also look at that and say, well, I wasn't in the top five percentile. You know, some of my friends went and started and ran public companies. I started a public company, but didn't run it, you know? So, so there's perspective on both sides and seeing your fortune also is important. And I think I learned that. And that's what you're getting at. And I think I really appreciate the question because of that. Yeah. I mean, I couldn't help but notice when I was doing research for this that you, both of your startups, your first two startups made you sick in some sense. You, you were hospitalized because of pain and you had to undergo an append, append, appendicitis. Appendicitis. Appen thank appendectomy. You. Sorry. I appendectomy. had appendicitis. I went through an, an appendectomy. Yeah. Thank you. And and in another situation, your teeth were grinding so much. And so, and then that caused like you almost to get hospitalized or you did get hospitalized. And it's like the startups and the grind of it got you to that point. And then you notice the connection of like, oh, do the startups make me sick? Do the startups make me hospitalized? And is this the thing on the pedestal that I'm actually telling other people that they should get into? What is going on here? So take me through those reflections and how you view them now running your third company. Yeah, I'm a little embarrassed hearing you tell that story that way, but it's so true. It's so <laughs> accurate. Um, I didn't get hospitalized for grinding my teeth for what it's worth. So I got better over time. My first company, I did get hospitalized very much because of the stress. Um, and in the second one, I think it was more just like, you know, crushing defeat, but it didn't get to the hospitalization part. And then now I feel like I do have some physical symptoms, but a lot less than I ever have before. So that journey was very much a, yeah, the physical manifestations give you another moment of pause where you start to realize like, wow, I really feel like I, 
I'm one of those people who puts it all on the field, you know? And I think that it's fair to say that there are people who do that and do great things. You know, you use Jordan as an example. Jordan put everything on the field. You know, I was just watching The Last Dance for a second time a few weeks ago, and it's crazy how much he put into that. But then there are also people, honestly, who are a lot more calm, I think, um, and who can do great work without all the stress. And I think slowly over time, I've, I've been trying to transition into that because, you know, you can't be doing this in your, and I know this doesn't sound very old to a lot of people, but I'm in my late thirties now and I'm, I'm staring down the idea that I'll still have this job in my forties and I'd really like to have a healthy family life and still continue to do great work. So I've really improved on, on this physical manifestation of work thing, but it definitely gave me a number of wake up calls. How has your definition of greatness evolved? You know, when I started my career, there was only one goal. You know, once I got into Udemy, there was only one goal to take it public. At that time, I didn't even think it was possible that it could go public without me being there. <laughs> but I would say that implicit in that goal is that it would still be there when it went public. Um, and, you know, now I think I'm much more willing to accept the deontological side of how I build companies rather than simply the ontological side. What I mean by that is the way in which I run a company, what impact it has along the way is almost as important as reaching its destination. And that has really freed up my mental clarity and calm around building companies. Who have you looked to in this time as role models? You know, you've had Justin Cad on here or Khan probably, uh, you know, recently. And it's pretty interesting because it's not an explicit part of his story, but he had a, had a win, almost exactly the same size as you to me, you know, a billion dollar win roughly uh, in his first company. Um, he wasn't there when it became a billion dollars, I don't think. Um, and if he was, he wasn't, you know, uh, I don't know. I don't know the exact story. And then he had two losses, only talks about Atrium, but he also started a uh, company, I forget the name of it, but it was a, a company that had raised a significant amount of money um, called Exec. There we go, Exec. And, you know, so I I look at that and say, wow, this guy seems really happy for someone who had, had one win that kind of, you know, that he kind of was there, you know, kind of had a similar story to me. And maybe I'm making that up. Maybe it's just in my head. And then two complete losses. And uh, so I've actually really been impressed by watching him. Uh, and, you know, I think Maven has a good shot at at, built, at being a great company. So I'm, I'm fortunate that I, I maybe not will not have the exact same story, but it does give me comfort knowing that you can be in your third company and it's okay no matter what happens. Yeah. What about online education speaks to your soul? I just really love learning. I think it took me a long time to appreciate how much I like learning things. <laughs> like I, I didn't, I just thought everyone was like this, you know? And Slowly over time, I realized like, no, like, okay, here, here's an interesting story. I was in my mid twenties. I'd gotten pretty fat. I was disappointed in myself. I looked in the mirror and was like, dude, I need to change this. And I was, I was newly single, which is a catalyst for getting fit. And I decided I was going to start doing something that was going to make me more fit. But I knew that, you know, regular exercise wasn't going to be enough for me. Like going to the gym is just not that motivating. I I, I do it. I, I still do it. And I did do it back then. But I started picking up basketball. A friend of mine was like, hey, you should come play. You know, we play every Tuesday mornings at USF, University of San Francisco. And so I started joining this game. And... I started playing in this game and every single week I was the last pick 
Hmm. And mind you, there were septuagenarians, 70-year-old players on the court. And I was being picked last. I was 25. (laughs) And I just kept playing every week. Why? And then I added another game on Thursdays. Why did I keep playing? I kept playing because it was really good exercise. (laughs) I was losing weight. (laughs) And the challenge of getting to the middle of the pack, I knew. I watched these people. I was playing with all these people. I knew that I could get there. And so over the course of the next two years, I sort of got to the middle middle of the pack. I probably was never in the top three or four players of the t- t- of the 10, but I definitely got a fifth to sixth place, you know, and consistently was getting picked, you know, in that range. And, you know, that is an example of something that very few people do in their mid twenties or even just basically after college, people don't pick up new sports. I think this is so weird. Like the only new sport that most people pick up is like tennis or golf. And otherwise, you know, I- I've picked up soccer since then and basketball I'm like amazed. Like everyone thinks that's weird. And people would say like, why are you doing this? And I had the exact opposite reaction. I was like, why would you not do this? Why would you at 25 cauterize all of your interests so that from then on you would have no new interests? That just to me seems like such a, such a withering of a human being. Uh, like, like you're, you're submitting yourself to that in a way that I just never, never have desire for. And so that's the realization is like, oh, that's actually unique, even though to me that seems a little bit like just common sense. Well, it points to something really important, which is that when you're learning, you're growing. And the best feeling, to me at least, is when we're growing and, and we're expanding our world. To me, I love that feeling of expanding our world. And what better way to do that than to learn? And I think the feeling of being the worst player and showing up again is the separator in life for so many people. If you can show up and get choked out by a woman when you're starting jujitsu and come back the next day, that is where the champion is made. And yeah, I I admire that. And I want to highlight that and ask how we can get more people thinking like that. I think you're doing a great job of it, Danny, because you ask the questions that underlie the questions. And so that's what people need to understand. I mean, I feel like the best way to get people to do it is just to talk about the fact that we're doing it, you know, Mm -hmm. and I felt the same way most people do. I did not feel like I was good enough. I still don't really, but I still show up every day and like, Literally this morning, I spent two hours playing soccer with a bunch of people who definitely played in college. And I didn't, I stopped when I was in sixth grade. So I really, I get my ass kicked every week in this game. I think many people want me to leave. Um, But this morning, I finally had that moment where I was in flow and I was actually playing with the team. And I still was probably the worst player on the pitch, but I was at least like hanging in there and, and making my team better than I was you know, taking up space and like, you can do that too. You know, everyone can do that. It's like, it is literally, it actually wasn't that hard once I got over the emotional side of it and just said, no, I'm just going to keep doing this. It wasn't that hard once you got over the emotional side. Hence the reason why all of so much of this podcast is dedicated to the emotional side of life, because you realize how much of it is actually very simple once you figure out your own mind, your own emotions, and how you react to life. What what do you know about learning that most people don't? I mean, obviously, we just talked about resilience. Another thing is is focus. I think that, you know, I think Tim Ferriss and what was his name? Josh Waitskin or something like that? Yeah. Um, have talked about this at length, and I'll, I'll reiterate it. Uh, in, a, in my own words, which is, you know, there's a discipline when learning on focusing on the thing that's really hard, but that's the most important. And, you know, as, a, as an example in soccer, the average soccer player at practice spends all of practice going through the motions, thinking about the moment at which they can shoot goals. This is 
the dumbest thing ever. You never, almost never in a soccer game, do you get to put the ball down, step back three paces, walk up three paces, and then kick the ball at a goalie. That just doesn't happen, okay? Penalty kicks are extremely rare, especially until you get to the pros, right? And aside from penalty kicks, which are fundamentally very easy, by the way, like penalty kicks are not a hard thing anyways from a skill standpoint. So... When I play with people and I watch them like, oh, I want to shoot goals. I'm just like, that's so counterproductive. And so the thing I can teach people about learning is to think about it like a process and think about it like a ladder and make sure that you focus on the next rung of the ladder of whatever you're trying to learn. And so in using the soccer analogy a step further, you know, the first six months of my learning journey in soccer, I told my coach, I just want to focus on passing and and the first touch. And like 80, 90% of what we did was just short passes and me touching the ball to the left, to the right, you know, right in front of me and passing it back. And like, that's all we did for for six months, you know? Um, And so... I think that's that can work. That works in so many different ways. There's so many, you know, things you can learn in which if you just start with the fundamentals. And it's like boring, right? On some level like like literally passing the ball back and forth, you know, the level of precision that you're eking out every every practice is so narrow. You're going from like passing it, you know, 15 degrees to the right to the left, right? Think of like a little bit of a a width there of where I'm passing to like you know, 14 degrees to 13 degrees to 12 to 11 to 10, all the way down to the point where you're actually getting the pass at the exact spot at the speed that you want, you know, and you're able to retrieve it if it gets back to you and you're doing one touch passing, etc. It's kind of boring, but that's like 90% of soccer. Like if you watch a soccer game, like, like what do they do? They touch the ball and they pass it. They touch the ball and they pass it. That's all they do. They, They barely ever dribble. You know, they barely ever shoot. Like they just touch the ball and pass it. So like you you have to be willing to focus on the thing that's hard, that's important. And a love and finding a love somehow for the thing that is boring, right? Yeah, that's such a great insight, Danny. It, it's a There's a bit of patience and faith involved in it. Like for a long time, I didn't know if I was getting any better, right? Like... I, you know, you show up t- t- to a game. So I, I basically have this regiment now, or when I started, I had this regiment of, I do practice on Wednesdays and a game on Friday. And this isn't the game where I got my ass kicked. This was a slightly easier game. Um, I was still getting my ass kicked every day in that game. So, but there were college, you know, they didn't play in college. So, and on Wednesday I'd practice and on Friday I'd still make a ton of mistakes and it would feel like there was no progress being made for like three, six, 10 weeks. And then finally something started to click and someone was like, wow, you're like a lot better than you were like when you, when it first showed up, which was actually kind of an insult. Cause essentially I still had a very average game, but I just had an average game as opposed to a really bad game. Right. And, you know, slowly over time, that became like, okay, now in this, you know, in this Friday game, which is a little bit of an easier game, I'm now like a formidable player on the pitch. Like people are not going to, you know, they're not going to take me on one on one unless they really feel like they're really feeling it, you know, and they're not they're going to pass me the ball, which for a long time, no one passed me the ball. Um, Like literally they would look at me in the eye. I'd be wide open and they'd look left and pass to someone else who was covered. Okay, man. Like and, you know, it took three to six months for that practice to for the practice to finally kick in in the game and i saw small moments of improvement along the way don't get me wrong and then finally it started to come together and so i think faith in your process is really important there's this beautiful line i've literally never read this book but bill walsh has this book like the score takes care of itself such a brilliant line and like, I don't think I need to read the book, if I'm going to be honest, like that, that end of itself taught me a lot. I'm sure reading the book would be great too, but, um, 
And so I think having faith that the process will lead to the results is a really difficult thing. I think you need evidence in your own life of that happening previously. And for me, I didn't even believe that learning or growing was possible. But then I started lifting weights and started seeing the manifestation physically and being like, oh, I see how X equaled Y. And I can see how if I apply that to other things that will also lead to results. But it's like, it's so ephemeral that it almost seems fake growing. And it's such a simple thing that we've accepted. And at this point in my life, I've accepted. But when I started in high school, it was just unfathomable that even doing something that I knew would work would actually work. Um, One point you said in there that I want to talk about is hiring a coach. Because some people who are listening to this podcast can't afford to hire a coach for the specific skill they're trying to improve. And I would love to ask, how do you find the right coach for any endeavor that you're trying to improve? You don't need money for a coach, first of all, because there are literally like on the soccer pitch that I play on, I'm playing with, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 other, other guys who are willing, if I ask for help, to help me. So, you know, if I started talking to people, of course, most of them would say no. But if I started talking to people and say, hey, do you want to do you want to do a kick around? Which is like my British friend's way of I think he says kick about, but like British friend's way of just saying like, hey, do you want to just get outside and kick the ball around? Just two people. And, you know, every single person on the pitch is my coach now. This is crazy, but like, or not every person, but a lot of them, like on this Wednesday game, I have had many moments where people have just been total assholes to me, but they've told me something useful. They've been like, you know, they'll, they'll, they'll curse at me. They'll be like, why the fuck did you, did you pass that ball bouncing? It needs to be on the ground. And instead of, and it like, trust me, it took me a lot. And there were times where I lashed out for sure. Like I was, you know, pissed because I was like, I don't know this game as well as you do. Like stop, you know, get off my back kind of thing. But then also, honestly, almost every time I'd say thank you. And I'd look at them and say, I really appreciate that. Thank you. You know, and these are like tough guys, right? Like this is not a situation in which I could be vulnerable. Like I'm not going out there and like pouring my heart out to them. I'm just saying real quick, you know. With confidence, thank you, blah, blah. And all of a sudden, these guys are constantly telling me what to do. Like, you know, three months later, I'm in this game and they're like, you know, they're explaining to me the game while I'm playing. Mm. This game is completely free. And there are games like this in, in every part of the world. There are versions of this, whether it is soccer, whether it is getting better at public speaking, whether it is getting better at writing, where if you show that you are willing to listen and want to listen, you will get, you will find coaches. They will just start coaching you. And, uh, you know, another thing that's interesting is like, I started this coaching one-on-one and my coach over time was like, look, one-on-one's great, but you need other people to join you because I can't, I can only teach you so much when it's just you and me. And so actually now my coaching is not one-on-one. There's like four or five people who come to this coaching and some of them pay $25 a session, which if you live in a big city, you can afford. Um, it's like, you know, going to a gym. It's like going to Soul Cycle. It's cheaper than Soul Cycle, you know? So, and if you, we wanted it to be $10 a session, I just convinced 10 people to do it. And all of a sudden this guy's making $100 for a session and we're each paying $10. And so... You know, there are lots of ways to do it. And then I bet you that there are people in the in the Bay Area right now who live nearby who are willing to do this for free. I, I'm sure that that's also true. Who just love to practice. They love playing soccer, you know. Um, and so I, I don't really believe that the story in someone's head of I cannot do this, but you can because of X, Y, or Z. I think that is rarely ever true. I mean, I hear this all the time from people who are from other countries and say, hey, you know, that won't work in India. That won't work in Brazil. And that's definitely true, by the way. There are clear cultural, economic, structural differences in every place I've ever been to. 
but it's rarely true, actually, uh, relative to the percentage of times people say it. So it's probably only true like 10% or 20% of the time that you think it's true. Um, so yeah, I think people aren't as unique as they think they are. Well, and you can argue for your limitations all day long, but what is that going to get you? Where are you going to end up? How, what, is, what is the result of you arguing for your own limitations? Or you could look and study someone like Arnold Schwarzenegger and be like, wow, he was in way worse situation than I'll be in. And look what he did. Look how he executed his plan to get out of his situation. And I think that's why having models is so effective and helpful. And now you are a model in my head of someone who was, has high confidence in himself, generally speaking, but was very poor at something that he devoted himself to and improved from doing it. And if people see that model, then they have it in their head the next thing that they're doing throughout their day of like, oh, I'm bad at this. But like, oh, wait, I can be good at this if I just keep doing it and learn and have coaches. So thank you for serving as that model. Yeah, I appreciate that. And I'll add something, which is that um, modern, you know, culture is so focused on making people feel better that we don't have this message of in order to truly succeed or feel better, it is your fault. You can achieve more than whatever you are at right now and you can achieve what you want. It may not be exactly in the way that you want. It may not turn out perfectly but you can achieve a lot better than where you are. And somehow the voices of weakness in society have basically said publicly, it's not my fault. I'm X, I'm Y, I didn't have Z, whatever the fuck excuse they want. And all of a sudden that has become the predominant narrative because there's another counter response that people do, which is that they coddle those people and all of a sudden say, hey, you're right. It's not your fault. You're right. The statistics show that like if you grew up in you know, South Carolina, you have a much lower likelihood of going to college than if you grew up in California. So all of a sudden, like it's OK. But like that totally misses the point that there are still literally like tens of thousands of people every year from South Carolina who go to college. So who fucking cares? Like you can't do anything about the fact that you're a statistic. You can do something about the fact that you're an individual. Yes. And the belief for me for a long time was I am normal. And when you believe you're normal, the problem with that is you start believing you are the statistic of whatever the median is around your area. And I think a lot of people don't even understand the possibility for them to grow past normal. And that's why this message is more important than ever. Totally. I'm amazed and I think you do a great job of this on your podcast um, but I'm amazed at how many people came from all sorts of backgrounds and ended up succeeding. And I think that's like one of the missions, I assume, of your podcast is to show different stories so different people can resonate with different stories. And so I would say that there's always someone out there who has been in your situation who has succeeded. They were totally ordinary or they were often subordinary when they started their journey and they eventually figured out their path. And I think for me, that's actually been really, really motivating. I've seen a lot of those stories. I've studied them just like you have. And that has really given me comfort that, you know, it is possible. You had a great post on your blog, which you talked about going from nobody to somebody in Silicon Valley. And you gave four steps. The four steps were one, observe and copy. Two, take shots. Three, find your edge. And four, fake it till you make it. And I thought that that makes sense in this environment and talking about this because if you want to grow past what you are currently doing in your day-to-day -day life, you might need to follow this playbook of one, observe and copy. Two, take shots. Three, find your edge. Four, fake it till you make it. I love it. I don't even remember writing that post or did not know it existed at this point. It's just kind of a hilarious admission in and of itself. So when you when I repeat back those words to you and we 
and you want to go to a, a different place right now. Let's say you, you're like, you know what? I'm done with my company. Um, I, I'm done with the startup world. I'm done with soccer. I'm done with everything I'm doing. I want to start an instrument. I want to start playing a new, new instrument. What are the first steps to becoming excellent at playing an instrument? The first thing I'd probably do is buy an instrument and I'd put it somewhere where I like had to pick it up if I, or I'd feel ashamed of myself. Like funny enough, like one of the first things that got me into tennis, which I'm playing now is the fact that I was with some friends, uh, my company offsite and my colleagues were like wanting to play tennis and I wanted to join them. And I just like went and bought a racket. It was $30, right? It's a cheap racket. My tennis, I just got a tennis coach and he's like, dude, this racket's really cheap and you need a new one. But like, whatever, it was $30. How much does that, you know, that's one session at SoulCycle, you know, um, or Barry's boot camp or whatever. And so I, I bought it and now I have a tennis racket. Now I'm like, okay. So that'd be my first step. Um, I'd buy a guitar or a piano or whatever. Uh, probably if it was a piano or keyboard, I wouldn't put the money in, but I'd buy like, like lessons or, or something like that. I do something that committed myself for a little bit of time. I'd probably start telling people that I'm learning it or I have an intention to learn it. I don't tend to lie. I don't act like – like when I was first playing soccer, I was like, oh, yeah, I've been starting to play soccer, but I'm still trying to figure out how to get into it. I said this at a, at a cocktail party, you know, like um, – and the guy uh, the guy I was talking to – and I probably said this to like 10 different people. The guy I was talking to then said, oh, my neighbor loves soccer. You should connect with him. And then the next day I followed up with that neighbor and we started playing soccer. And now we play every single week together, multiple times a week often. Um, and so that would be the next step. I'd get lessons. Uh, I'd also listen to a lot of music mm. from that instrument. I believe in full immersion. You know, there are two different ways to learn language in high school. And I think one is just patently wrong. But a lot of people act like it's acceptable. And then another one is like the only way to learn language, which is total immersion. It's, by the way, there's a ton of studies and stuff, I'm sure, that prove this. But in junior high, I had Spanish teachers who would – who from the day we arrived in class, most of us had did not know a lick of Spanish other than hola and gracias, you know, and – from the day we arrived in class, spoke entirely in Spanish. I did not hear them speak English until parent-teacher conferences, which is nuts for Spanish 1 and Spanish 2. And by the time I was done with Spanish 2, I was close to fluent in Spanish. It was crazy. I mean, I wasn't fluent. Like, I mean, there, my vocabulary wasn't there. But literally, I could just have an ongoing conversation with someone in, you know, at that time I was traveling to Mexico and I could go to Mexico and I could just like have a conversation with someone. And it was because of total immersion. And then in Spanish three and four in high school, my teachers taught mostly in English. It made most of the students feel a lot better. Okay. There were a lot of students in the class who preferred it because it felt better. I hated it because I knew it was less effective. And this conflict between feelings and effectiveness is such a critical aspect of learning and really succeeding in general. It's like if you let your feelings get in the way of success, like you'll, you'll always, you'll, you'll always lose because ultimately like you have to challenge your feelings in order to succeed because you have to, you have to do what's the right thing to do rather than what feels good in the moment. And so, so this building back to guitar you know, let's say I was learning guitar, I would listen to a lot of guitar. Like, I mean, of course, right? I'd like, I'd like download some Spotify playlists that were like guitar only. And like any time I was like going for a run or on a flight or whatever, I'd probably start to make friends with people who are playing guitar, who are learning, people who are good, but also people who are learning with me. And, you know, I think for me, I'm not musically inclined. I think it'd take me a long time to learn it, but uh, eventually I think I'd, I'd be able to play the guitar. I think what you're speaking to with the total immersion is that we pick up on so much nuance that we don't even realize that we're picking up on when we're so in it to that extent. And 
I think it, it's been remarkable to me when I fully devoted myself to something, how the world just maps itself to being fully in it. So that's really cool. I, I wanted to talk to you about your biggest educational experience of your life, which was potentially the most painful, which was running your second company. And you mentioned that on LinkedIn, how I guess the failure of it was the most educational experience of your life. What about the failure or what about the way it worked out was unexpected that led you to feel like you grew tremendously from it? Yeah, just to clarify, I think it was the biggest professional learning experience of my life. I would say that there was plenty of personal things that were probably more impactful, but it's a great topic for conversation. You know, you learn a lot about yourself when you push yourself to your limits. You learn what you're good at and what you're not good at. And at, at, at my last company, um, which was called Sprig at the time, um, which is now a different company, so uh, which I'm actually an investor in, which is fun. But, um, you know, when, when I was running the food delivery company, I realized how bad I was at operations. Um, I realized that just because I had a vision of something didn't mean that it was the right fit for me. I realized that I didn't love managing, like, you know, we had a total of 1300 people at some point, a lot of them part-time. So it's not equivalent to like, if a, if a CEO tells you they have 1300 people and they're running Shopify or something, it's not the same, but, but, you know, it's a lot of humans that you're in charge of and responsible for. And, um, and I wasn't, you know, it wasn't my strength to run that large of an operation. I also learned some major blind spots in how I approached Sprig. Um, I was very me too focused, you know, that, that comment that I make in the blog post about like imitate, um, you know, uh, I think it was observe and then copy, you know, sometimes that can go too far, right? Mm. You, you have to observe and then integrate and then copy mm. because if you truly just copy what you see, you'll often apply it incorrectly in a new situation. And so at Sprig, we tried too hard to be a little bit like Lyft or like Amazon or whatever. And like, we weren't just Sprig. Like our strategy wasn't just like, this is the first principles, best thing to do in this market. Um, I learned how easy it is to fall into the trap of venture capital and like, you know, raising too much money really is a huge problem. And I think people, you know, there's so much success and the news cycle is so focused on raising venture capital. Lots of people talked about this, but it's just so real that once you raised, you know, I think we raised 60, somewhere around $60 million. You know, once you do that, you have very limited options for what you can do with your company. You know, it's just like, you have to be a multi hundred million dollar company for anyone to get value from that. And that's a really high bar. And you also have to do it in like, six to 10 years, right? So you could potentially become like, I think Sprig could have become a billion dollar company, honestly, but not in 10 years, no way. Food companies take three to four years to figure out their first location. And we tried to figure out our first location in less than two years. And like, it just didn't, we didn't get there. And yet we were on a venture speed. So we just like launched our second location. Like, so I learned a lot. Um, at Sprig, it also like scale gives you a lot of lessons, right? Sprig is really the biggest company I've ever run. Actually, I don't think people realize it because it didn't succeed. They, they, they think that, oh, like, you know, it must be smaller than Udemy when you were there. But like, no, Udemy was, you know, doing, I don't remember, four to 10 million in, in GMV when I left and was like 20, 20, 25 people. I honestly don't remember. So these numbers could be wrong. But um, Sprig was 1300 people at its peak was a $22 million run rate revenue business and, you know, had uh, raised 60 million in venture capital and I was CEO the whole time. So the responsibilities and that all happened within two and a half years. So the speed of growth and the responsibilities that I had uh, forced me to learn lessons that you just can't learn if you're at a smaller company or your company's not growing it that fast. That makes sense. And how did that change your perception of yourself? This is, Tani, you're, you're really good. Because that, you know, I missed the most important lesson. And, and I'll share it now, which is the most important lesson is that I was not Sprick. I was not Udemy. 
the most important lesson was, you know, hey, I'm, I'm Gog and Biani. And like, there's that, that's like, that's also not that amazing. Like, it's not as, as impressive as Sprig. It's just sort of is, right? And it's not nearly as negative either as Sprig. It's like, I am still going to exist before and after this company. I have a set of skills that I'm building no matter what. And keeping yourself a little separated from the company can help get through moments of difficulty and help make decisions dispassionately which I think could be very powerful. Now the flip side, and I'll admit, is it does change your hunger level a little bit and you have to figure out how to find hunger and excitement without that existential angst. And so I think like one of the challenges of Maven has been to find that level of excitement and energy uh, because I don't have as much of a chip on my shoulder while still being dispassionate because I still think you just make better decisions if you're a little calmer and more dispa- dispassionate. And so what happened then in 2017 to 2020, taking the sabbatical? You, you describe it as a self-taught masters in modern humanity. And so I guess some of these lessons are being learned in that time and really integrated, but what advice do you have for people who are taking sabbaticals themselves? And what did you learn? My number one piece of advice is to take a real sabbatical, like do immersion, right? A lot of people call it a sabbatical when they still take, you know, three to five coffee meetings a week or, or heaven forbid, like literally 20 coffee meetings a week. It's like, hey, I'm on sabbatical. I, I traveled to go meet the most successful people in the world. And I was like exploring a new business idea. I'm like, no, that's just your job. Like as a CEO or a founder, being in between and exploring an idea is part of your job. That is part of the time that you are putting into the company. Just because you're not getting paid doesn't mean you're not doing your work. Those things are completely separate anyways, because you don't really make much money as a CEO. You only make money when you exit anyways. So equity value is, if equity value is being built, you know, which it is during the discovery phase, then you're working. And so my first recommendation is to take a real sabbatical. I mean, if you can, and that, that is a moment of luxury, less about money. Honestly, I met lots of people who were on sabbaticals who were pretty poor, um, but more about luxury of personal circumstance, right? If you have family that needs you, if you have, you know, kids, like these things make it a lot harder. And so I get that, but that just makes it more powerful to actually take advantage when you have a sabbatical because like you never know when that opportunity is going to come again my second piece of advice is to like challenge yourself a little and do things that are a little bit like that are a little uh, uncomfortable this is obviously a theme of this whole conversation but you know i went to places that were very hard you know And I think also, by the way, like it doesn't always have to be hard. It can be really fun and enjoyable. Like I'm not always looking for difficulty. It's just what's interesting to talk about in the podcast. I probably spent a lot of time just doing things that were super fun. But a lot of that fun came because I was willing to be uncomfortable for a little bit. Being alone is extremely uncomfortable for anyone. You know, For you. It's not uncomfortable for me. Fair. Yeah. Um, I, I would still say the type of aloneness that there are types of aloneness that would be uncomfortable for you, Danny. I, I mean, if you take anything to the extreme, but I, there are very few people who are sitting by themselves for 60 minutes every day, just with no phone, no laptop, completely unplugged. And when I tell yeah. people that they're uncomfortable by that thought, but to yeah. me, that is enjoyable. I am best friends with my own mind. So I, I totally get that. I've done a fair amount of meditation myself and, um, Maybe, maybe, I mean, cha- challenging you may not be the right, right thing in this moment, but a conversation for another day is, I, I do think that there are many things about travel that might, that would, would push anyone, uh, yeah. you know, it, you could be alone by being, uh, with other people, but being with people who are of a very different income level than you and spend time with people who are literally at the poorest end of the totem pole in, in, in the world. And that might make someone feel uncomfortable, uh, in aloneness. Um, and so I don't mean alone, like literally just like with your own thoughts. I mean, alone, like in a place that seems hostile to you, 
like when I was in Havana, Cuba, I honestly thought the place hated me. Like I, I, I thought they didn't, I thought that it, it wasn't built for people like me. And um, that was a form of aloneness. There were people everywhere and I was talking to people all the time, but it was a very difficult place to be. And yet I learned so much from being in Havana. I spent a month there. So that, that was a big part of it. A couple of days is very different from a month. Were you seeking out the difficulty or just seeking out difference of experience? I think just seeking out difference and willing to accept that difficulty might be part of it. I don't think, I think that's also the other thing. Like I, I just wrote a tweet about this, which is kind of funny because no one read it. It's like clearly did not go, go viral. I think it's probably one of my more profound comments, but you know, I, I, I wrote this thing that basically says, you know, a lot of people overuse therapy. And, you know, your question made me think of that. It's like, you know, you don't need to do difficult things just because they're difficult. I don't want this conversation. I don't want people to come away from this conversation thinking, oh, I should just do hard things and like, rah, that's awesome. It's like, no, I just do whatever's necessary. I'm dispassionate about whether or not it's hard or easy. You know, if it's easy, great. Like there were many things that I did. Like I went to Antarctica. It was like pretty easy, right? It's like a, you go on a beautiful boat. Like we drank wine every night. Like, yeah, it's cold as fuck, but like you wear layers and like, it's all good. It was just super fun. Extremely powerful experience, you know, extremely powerful. Um, and so I would say easy, hard is not relevant. Um, just interesting and different is important. And interesting and different sometimes means, you know, pushing through what's hard. And what do you learn about yourself from doing all of this work, let's say? I developed my own personal identity that's separate from the identity of work, separate from the identity of my family contacts, my friends, separate, for, separate from like my entire life to that point. You know, when you travel alone for that much time, you're able to have so many fresh new experiences. I'll give you an analogy. Danny, I'm sure you have friends that you've been friends with since you were a kid, a couple of them at least, and you have family. When you go back to your family, your friends, you notice that a version of yourself that's old pops up, right? You fall into old habits. And honestly, I think that's amazing. I have a lot of friends from when I was a kid and I, I love hanging out with them and they're core to my who I am today. At the same time, sometimes it's really nice to be in a situation where you just meet new people because they don't carry all that baggage and they just see you for who you are today. And also different people see you differently. You know, a like uh, a middle-aged Colombian woman might see you very differently than a young, you know, Cuban man, than a, than a like, you know, a, a Chinese scholar that might see you differently than like a Jewish grandmother, right? And so like when you meet different people, um, especially as a fresh new human to them, because, you know, this is the first time they've ever known of your existence. Uh, you get to really see who you are and who you've become. And it both challenges you because there are challenges in sort of how you come off in your first few moments and how you come off to new people. But also it's like pretty amazing. Like it's really empowering. You know, you get to see like, oh, like, you know, that story that I have from when I was like 16, is it actually how I'm showing up today at all? And like, I can ditch that, you know? Um, so I thought that was really powerful. Yeah, it, it's fascinating how people will view you this, you're the same person, it feels like, but people are viewing you so differently. And often I find that it speaks more about the person who's making the judgment about the person than it is about the person who is judged and what it actually says about them. Totally. I'm taking a, a course um, for, for called Leaders in Tech. Uh, it's based on this course at Stanford uh, Business School um, called Interpersonal Dynamics. And that is one of the most fundamental lessons of the, of the class. Um, and it's a program, I guess, not just a class, but the program basically helps you understand that anything you say, um, there are, you know, 11 other people in your group and like hearing their different reactions, like they took away completely different things from like one statement I made, you know, and it's fascinating to confront that and realize like, yeah, I mean, we're all just living in our own heads. And like every once in a while, we like decide to drop out of that and bounce some shit around with the person next to us. But like, 
the truth is 90% of how we see the world is our own view. And that also means 90% of everyone else you, you interact with is it's their own view. And that's, that's a pretty interesting lesson to learn and relearn over time. Well, one thing that building a company forces you to do to some respect is to look at how your perception of the world matches up with the people around you. Like, if you don't have a product that is selling, it is because something about that process is not helping people achieve a certain outcome, which means your version of reality is different than other people's version of reality. So by very nature, the entrepreneur is getting better at understanding different realities and mapping their own world into that reality. Has that proven true from your perspectives? 100%. Good to hear. I would love to talk to you about reflections on your third company, Maven, which has been really interesting to see me see you tweet about and see you write different posts about because it's like getting a, a live look at somebody who's been through the, the ringer twice and now is coming at it with seemingly more wisdom. And I really appreciate that. So one topic that I've never heard talked about before that is really cool that I feel like you could only get from running multiple different companies is about the tempo of a company. Hopefully. I just got one too. National alert. Damn. It's just a test. Oh, wow. That's so crazy. Yeah. I cannot believe. You're in Austin and I'm in, San I'm in Oakland and we both got the same thing. And it was coming out of your, your like, it must have been coming out of your like Google Home or something like that, Alexa? Um, I'm not sure what, I assume it was my phone. That was just really loud. I thought the oh, atomic okay. bomb had just been dropped, is what yeah, I, what my first fuck? thought. <laughs> really puts Anyways. life in perspective. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, one thing is going to happen over the next 50 years of us being alive that shocks us to our core that we can't believe is actually happening for good or bad, probably both, mm -hmm. you know? So I think about that often is like the likelihood of a bad thing happening today is not that likely a week, a little more a month, a year, even greater and a decade, like almost certainly an unlikely thing will happen. So yeah, in California, we live in constant fear of an earthquake yeah. And it's very, very subtle, right? Because you barely think about it on a daily basis. But, you know, it very much is part of the, it's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a manifestation of what you just described. That is more certain and more clear than like a, an atomic bomb or AI taking over the world and hacking everyone's computer systems or whatever. Like, no, an earthquake has already happened in the past. It will happen in the future. You have no idea when. You don't know how catastrophic it's going to be and it could literally like destroy your home, you know? Um, so I know, I know that was just a way to relate to what you just said. Um, and obviously earthquakes are nothing like the thing that would shock us. I mean, there are things that are going to shock us much more than that. Yeah. But I was talking about tempo of company. So yes. <laughs> clearly more important <laughs> than the atomic bombs or anything like that. But I, I really found it fascinating you talking about the tempo of companies because you said Sprig had a daily slash weekly heartbeat. Udemy had a monthly heartbeat. Maven is a quarterly heartbeat. And this has profound effects on how you run the business. There are a lot of entrepreneurs listening to this who are thinking about their own heartbeat now of their own company. How did you come to this realization and how does that impact how you do certain things? As an entrepreneur... I think almost every entrepreneur has this experience, especially if you're a consumer entrepreneur, you're literally every day like refreshing your daily sales, right? So like I'm always looking at the sales of both Maven as a whole, but also a bunch of our instructors. And I'm just like looking at their sales and seeing how they're doing, making sure they're doing well. And it, I have slowly over time realized that that has a big effect on how I look at the business because I always want the business to give me feedback loops that are quick, you know, Hey, we put something out and in the next week we see whether it worked or not. Social networking companies are like that. They have millions of users, they ship a product and you basically know within, you know, 50, uh, you know, 50 minutes, 15 minutes, 
you know, an hour, maybe a couple days a week, you know, the results of that experiment. Um, and, you know, at Sprig, that was true. Uh, you know, within a week, we'd sort of see the results of a lot of our experiments. Um, and the company basically like had growing revenue every week. So like every week we'd grow and, you know, for, for two and a half years straight, basically we grew almost every single week. Wow. Maven is like literally like in a lot of ways, the opposite. It's still a, it's still a consumer company. You know, we sell to consumers, but our average instructor is going to teach a course like three to four times a year. So, and it takes three months or so to build a course and like put it out there and sell it and get to the first, you know, starting point. Now we've tried to make that six weeks, six to 10 weeks, but it's still short and it's still long. I mean, and so anything we do, like, let's say we do something in January, we may not see the results until, you know, 50 to a hundred of our instructors go through one or two cohorts which might take anywhere from six weeks to six months for, for enough data to, to show up, you know? And so we often find ourselves doing something one quarter thinking it didn't work because we're paranoid and like want a quicker feedback loop. And then two quarters later, we look back and like, wow, that was like the most impactful thing we've done in the last, in the last nine months. And that has happened so many times. So the way that affects the company is, you know, we talked about faith earlier, faith in the process. At Maven, we've had to be much more faithful to the process and we can't experiment as much. We have to just drive with conviction and hope we're right. And then we have to keep doubling down if we feel like we're happy with the early signal because the early signal is super noisy, but like we get some signal. And it's been very interesting to see a company that's on this cycle. Now, I would assume that there are B2B companies that are on annual cycles. You know, they sell to enterprise. It takes six months to a year to build a relationship and actually deploy and get it, get a contract out or whatever. I cannot imagine that. I don't have the patience for it. I don't think maybe one day I would, but, and actually Maven will eventually have to do that. So at some point I will have to find the patience for that type of business. But for now, we're on quarterly or even like semi-annual sort of cadences. And it really affects how you look at the numbers, how you think about the business, what strategic decisions you make, how much, how data-driven you are versus how intuitive you are about decisions. And it's really forced me to, to be a lot more intuitive about how I make decisions because I can't just throw out an A-B test and find out whether I was right like two weeks later. It just doesn't work that way at Maven. Well, it's a good thing you have the experience from the previous two companies to hone that intuition. Um, I also would love to talk to you about like you forgetting how difficult or stressful it is. <laughs> you mentioned the, the fir- one of the first things you said was this was way harder and more stressful three years into it than I remembered it being. And if you, if you think about like, you're a smart guy. Like, how come we don't remember the things that are difficult and we have amnesia? Why is that the case? It's an evolutionary benefit that of just like every human deals with some level of challenge or trauma or difficulty in their lives. And if they responded and became, you know, scared every time that happened, they would never be innovative enough to get to figure out how to get over it. And one of the things that's made humans so successful is that as we have had challenges, we have eventually figured out our way out of them. I think about like, somehow I have an image of a deer in my head, you know, like deer are the classic animal that have the opposite evolutionary traits. You know, when they are, when anything smells of danger, their instinct is to fight or flight every single time. And of course, I'm sure that someone who's a biologist would tell me a lot more about deer. I don't fucking know. But like my perception is that humans are very different. You know, the next time they see a predator, they might try to scare it. The next time they see a predator, they might try to run. The next time they might try 
to, or I should say, we might try to, you know, build a weapon. That first weapon didn't work. All right, we're going to try a second weapon. Oh, that didn't work. And like, keep in mind that all this is happening. And like each time, most of these people are dying is like how it happened, right? It's like most of these people died. And so the people who had the wrong answers, like slowly over time died. And then there was like the more innovative person who've kind of figured shit out and they succeeded, right? And, you know, we don't have that kind of evolutionary, um, you know, life or death reality anymore. But on a business level, we do, you know, businesses have this level of evolution, they die and they succeed. Um, and on a like individual level, like we still do a lot of like s- small deaths, right? Like giving up on something versus like continuing on or innovating our way through it. And so I think it's really powerful that we forget how hard it was when we failed because it allows us to then put the effort in again to overcome that. And that's how we move forward. And that's how we create progress. Yeah. If we forget how difficult something is, it gives us excitement because it's like, oh, wow, I don't even remember how difficult this was. So I'll try again. Um, Speaking of trying again, one thing that I've tried many times to do in my career as an entrepreneur, let's say, is to launch an online product or course. I was hoping we would talk about this. Yeah, (laughs) might as well at the end, you know. Um, And so... I, I launched the art art of interviewing very recently. I've launched a bunch of different courses in the past, but I feel very committed to seeing this one through and making it the most valuable resource for people on the internet who want to learn about interviewing or learn about asking questions in some respect. You've seen so many people go through this process of teaching things. And my, my course is not cohort-based course, which you might recommend me do. But other than changing the model of doing it, what ways can I improve as an instructor or teacher to help give people the best experience? That's kind of like asking me, other than changing the business model or (laughs) the strategy of Sprig, how would you make it succeed? And I could give you an answer and I will give you an answer, but just to be clear, um, If your true goal is to make it valuable, you have no chance with a video-based course because fundamentally it is, it is a, uh, it is a very, very difficult thing to derive value for something that does not have learning, especially if it does not have inherent motivational aspects to it. And so without a set of peers or an interaction with you to motivate someone to get through it, uh, you will see that there will be a lot of people who simply won't. And actually, there's a flip side of that that's positive, which is if your goal, Danny, is only to find another five Dannys, right? And to and to sort of encourage another five Dannys, and you're okay if there are a thousand people who don't become Danny, then actually it's totally fine. So I'll take back what I said a little bit or, or caveat it and say, Look, if your goal is just to make sure that it's valuable for those who are highly motivated, maybe you can do it without the cohort based thing. But, you know, it's not just data, it's a feeling. If you have you ever been through a cohort based course? Uh, a couple. Yeah. Yeah. Um what did you th- like wh- why did you decide to do a video based course or an asynchronous course? Because I didn't feel like the experience that I got in the cohort-based course was enough to, like, it it didn't make enough of an impact on me, even though I know the instructor's intention was for it to make an impact on me. So Uh I thought, oh, okay, if this person put all this time and effort and energy into doing this, and I would have preferred just to be able to do this on my own accord, then why am I going to create the cohort for someone else? When this person has a lot more experience, a lot more knowledge, tried to do it the best way possible, and it didn't have an impact on me. Yeah, I think you're right, by the way. Um, There's a significant set of people who are sufficiently self-learners that they will go through a asynchronous learning experience and they'll get a lot out of it. Maven's more focused on the numbers game of just trying to make it valuable for more people. 
And we don't want to have that be the only way that you succeed. Because I've seen that with Udemy and see the challenge of it. But I think in your intention, you are clearly, I mean, you challenged me really hard when I said, you know, I talked about aloneness. And you're like, nah, I can spend an hour alone. So I gather from what I see of you that you would have no problem going through a video-based course if it was helpful for you. And I think that you can make it incredibly valuable. The thing that I would do is layer in some of the motivational aspects anyways. So I haven't looked through your curriculum enough to really give you a lot of feedback, but an example of a thing that I would recommend you do is make sure that you encourage people to practice the art of interviewing and not just listen to how you do it. Um, and I would like nudge people throughout the experience to go and practice and interview people. In a cohort-based course, I would literally set up interviews for each other. And I would have them do 30 minute interviews, you know, and that would be like the way I would do it because that would get, you know, 70% of your students to actually get, go through with it. Whereas if you just nudge them, you'll go from 5% to 8% or 10%, but still it's a huge impact, especially if you're only looking for a few winners. Um, Another thing I would recommend you do is you, you do need to think about how to market it. I mean, I mean, it, it's really shitty, honestly, but you're essentially competing and so are we at Maven. You're competing with free and it's actually not free, but everyone thinks that it's free, which is university education, extremely subsidized and all education all the way up until you get to university is actually free you know, pay taxes, but that's it. And then university, you, you take on debt. Um, so you're competing with a mental model that people have built over their lives that they shouldn't pay for learning, that learning should be forced upon them, not that they should do it out of their own accord. And that they um, really shouldn't learn after university. And so your job, which sucks, by the way, and it pisses me off that this is true, but your job is to convince people to break those three sort of rules and both pay for it, spend the time to use it, and do it completely out of their own accord. Um, uh, and so you have to market it. You have to tell people about it, talk about it, et cetera. You've been doing a great job of that. I've been really enjoying it. Um, and I think you have a huge impact with it uh, if you if you continue to you know share it with more people. Um, and I think that that's it's a tough thing because so many people find it find courses to be annoying. You know they they don't like the promotional aspect of people promoting their course, and I totally get it. But I also think that they're super arrogant to be annoyed at that type of promotion and not be annoyed at other types of promotion that are there all the time. Like, it's okay for Danny to hawk his podcast all the time, but it's a problem if he's talking his course. Why? The course is honestly like 10 times more valuable than the podcast. Like, the, at least than one individual episode on a podcast. And I think the whole podcast is like an amazing magnus opus for you and like magnum opus for you. And like, I think it's a fantastic thing you've done and probably is more powerful than the course. But like pound for pound, you know, the course is obviously going to be more impactful. And so I think it's crazy, but that's the world we live in. And there's just so much like, you know, positioning in the culture. So the other thing I'd recommend you do when you market it is make sure that you're aware that people don't want you to be hawking their, your course. And so you have to do it in ways that are, um, that will ingratiate you to them as opposed to turn them off. Yes. And this, I'm so happy you brought this up because this is something that held me back from doing a course for a long time. But I realized the, my own lack of, um, like I was just scared. I was scared of being that person who was hockey a course. But then I realized like, oh, if I really believe in this and I think it's an amazing resource and I think it's the best resource on interviewing in the world, I'm going to share it and I'm going to be happy to share it. And I'm also not going to care if you are upset at me sharing it. Because I'm not upset mm -hmm. w when I share the podcast a lot and you don't like that, that, that doesn't bother me as well. And so I got over that hump somehow. How did I get over that hump? How, how have people gotten over that hump for themselves? Have you seen? I think there's a number of things. One is just becoming more comfortable in your own skin. You yeah. seem like you are really comfortable in your own skin, Danny. I don't know if you were to begin with, but... I imagine, yeah, you're shaking your head. So I imagine it's a journey. Mm -hmm. And so the more comfortable you are with yourself, the more you can clearly see things. I mean, the truth is your fear was about ego. Yes. And so your fear was about ego, right? It's like, 
hey, I know that this is something that some people are not going to respond well to. Going back to the interpersonal dynamics thing, right? 12 people in a room, you know, 11 people might see something totally fine and one person might not. That one person is going to be the vocal person and that's who's scaring you. And so as you become more comfortable with yourself and you know that you showed up just fine in this situation, all of a sudden you aren't listening to that one person who's your critic, but you're listening to the five people who are like your fans in the room. And that's, you know, that's a huge internal struggle that everyone deals with when they're self-authoring publicly because self-authoring in general requires this level of like, you know, checking your ego. That's just extremely difficult and painful. Um, but it sounds like you've done that work. Yeah. And self-authoring requires you to know that this is where you are. This is where you're going and tell the world about that by, by just by the way you show up. Right. And that, is like, if you can get to that place, that is what I hope to inspire people to do. And that's what I've inspired other people to do through this podcast. I hope to do the same thing from people following the the journey of the course, as well as, as well as other things that I launch in the future. So I'm so grateful for you, your time. This was incredible, lived up to the expectations. And then some, I would love to ask you the final question for this podcast, which is about a challenge. A challenge points to the place in you heart, in your heart, you think people should take this conversation and actually do something with it. Does a challenge come to mind? Let's talk about learning. Just pick something, anything that you've been interested in for a lot of your life. And if you're someone who doesn't learn a lot of new things, pick something that's like adjacent to something you already know. Okay. So like pick something easy, but also something that's a little uncomfortable. And just try to give yourself like six months. Okay, six months in your life is nothing, all right? Six months is nothing. And and embark on a misadventure to figure out how to get better at that thing. And, you know, we've talked about a lot of ways you can do that in this podcast. I think there's probably other ways that I haven't even thought about. But whatever that thing is that you want to learn. And remember to, to, to go and try and learn it and practice it, okay? Because you have to learn, you have to learn the new thing and then you have to go try doing it and then you have to you have to learn again and then practice. So learn and practice a new thing. I challenge anyone who's listening to this to pick up something, you know, a hobby, it could be a professional skill, whatever, to just go and figure out how to learn the skill and get better at it. And if you get better, like, man, I would love to see you in my DMs or in Danny's DMs, Danny, please forward them to me. But I'd be so grateful. That would make me so happy. Um, and I'm happy to answer questions about it, you know, uh, as well. If you're struggling with something or you want advice on something, you know, I'm happy to help. I think the six months piece is so key. And I, I tell people you have to commit to it for three months. That's you're not actually trying to get better if you're if you haven't done it for three months. So. Let that be the barometer, the metric six months for you. And definitely send me a message if you are in the pursuit of something and working towards it or afterwards. I would love to hear how that went for you. Send me a DM or you as well. And where can we send people to send you that DM? I'm on uh, LinkedIn, Goggin Biani, and Twitter at Goggin Biani. It's pretty easy. I, I mean, as long as you're listening to this and my name's on the, on the, on the title, uh, you can just, you can find me on either of those. I'm, I'm pre- I read all my DMS, um, but I don't always respond. Um, uh, just depends on whether or not it makes sense to respond or not, but I read every single one. So I'll read it for sure. And you also have a hot take that I'm, I'm not letting you get out of here with, which is, I think LinkedIn is better than Twitter for most professionals. Don't tell anyone I over there that I said that. Why is that the case? The content's just mostly better, honestly. Mm. Twitter has a lot of garbage content that's mm. really annoying. And you sift through it and every once in a while you have good stuff. On LinkedIn, like it's the opposite. It's like mostly signal. I'd say that like the best stuff on Twitter is better than the best stuff on LinkedIn. But the average stuff on LinkedIn is better than the average stuff on Twitter. So I'd sort of amend my statement or add to it by saying that I think on average LinkedIn is better. And so if you have a habit, I'd rather you have a LinkedIn habit than a Twitter habit. But if you can appropriately sift through what's on Twitter, 
Um, it is true that some of the smartest people say some of the most brilliant things on Twitter and they don't, the, the smartest people don't go onto LinkedIn. So it's really your is like sort of, you know, it's, it's, it's an interesting selection bias on both in both directions. It's like the smartest and dumbest people both populate on Twitter. Yes. <laughs> That's funny. Who are some of the best LinkedIn follows? Because I don't really spend a lot of time there. But if you were to check, it's so inter- it's so industry specific that it's like, like I don't even feel like I should share. You know, people I like to follow. Um, Ali Miller is a big Maven instructor and someone I've been following for a while. I think she puts out pretty good content on AI. I don't think you really need anyone else. Um, you know. Uh, I've been impressed by Elena Verna and Brian Balfour over at Reforge, even though they're, you know, they're in the same space as Maven. I've, I've loved them. Um, I I personally think that I, I put out some content that I think is interesting and resonant with people. So I hope people look at my, my profile. Um, but you know what's funny about LinkedIn? Like, I don't even have a specific person that I read. I just read. I just follow a lot of people and I just sort of like see what they post. And I think it's pretty good. Um and actually, what I really mean when I say I like LinkedIn better than Twitter is I like posting on LinkedIn better on Twitter because I like the comments. So it was now that I'm like thinking back to that statement, it's less about the content being better on LinkedIn than Twitter. And it's more about my experience as a creator on LinkedIn being better than on Twitter. I also think LinkedIn is earlier in its process of being so focused on virality, like Twitter has become so feast or famine that good posts, I think better, like some of my better posts don't go viral because they just don't have the right hook or they whatever. And it's like, dude, I think that that's actually because the algorithm is just a little bit too focused on addiction. Mm. And like LinkedIn is slightly less sophisticated on that front. And so like you still, your posts still get some level of traction. Um, And I think that that's also a benefit of LinkedIn for a creator. Dropping bangers on the different social media platforms as they exist on October 4th, 2023. Incredible, incredible time. I really appreciate you. Like this was, this was a lot of fun. You have incredible takes on a variety of different things. And like, there's an air of like, listen, I think I'm great. I also think I don't know anything. And those types of people, I feel like I resonate with the most. And I really appreciate that. So keep being you, man. Thanks, man. I really appreciate it, Danny. This is this has been an incredible experience. I I, I think I, I can see why everyone was recommending that I go on this podcast. <laughs> and we'll use that as a clip for the art of interview. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate you.